Okay, hello. Um, so I'm going to continue talking about Barclay, unless there are any questions uh, you want me to address before that. Okay, so um, right. So we're now we're talking about part one of the principles. Again, there. There's only there's only one part, <laughs> but you have to call it part one because there's an introduction and part one. So, and part one of the principles is where Berkeley develops his famous uh, doctrine of idealism. Um, but uh, rather than talk about that right away, I'm going to first say some things about language. In other words, the use of signs. Um, those are not exactly the same, but anyway. Uh, this is going to be about both. Um, and then after that, I'll talk about um, idealism and then some other topics connected to that. So... Um, so first of all, I'm going to reintroduce the distinction I've made several times before between syntax and semantics. I don't know if I've explained very well what this distinction is. Um, and well, I guess among people who make this distinction, they don't all mean the same thing by it. But, um, but one way of understanding what it is is that if you have a language or a system of signs, um, there are two kinds of rules you could imagine that, that apply to the use of the signs. So one is rules by which the signs go together with each other. Right? So like what order can words come in in a sentence? Or what sentences are you allowed to, allowed to write down as a conclusion after you've written certain sentences of the premise, as the premises? Um, so those rules, um, right, of like, um, maybe I should write it this way. Here's the signs in the language. So the rules that connect the signs with each other, these are syntactic rules. Right, syntax means uh, ordering together in Greek. That's what, so you can see why they're called syntactic rules. How do we order the signs together with each other? But on the other hand, you have, or you might imagine, you also have rules that connect the signs to other, to like things outside the language. Right, so, for example, a rule that connects a certain name to a certain person who it's the name of. Um, or a rule for determining, based on the words that are in a sentence and the order in they're in, what the sentence is about, like what it claims about the world. Right? So those rules are called semantic rules. These are, these are like 20th century names, so they're not the names that Locke and Barclay are going to use, but I'm introducing them here because I think that uh, um, they don't have names for this difference. So it's useful to introduce them from somewhere else. So, um, so remember that according to Locke, the relationship between a word and the idea it signifies um, was, so to speak, that we're allowed to think one when we think the other. Right? So, um, so according to Locke, an example 
of, of words signifying an idea. Um, so, I mean, of course, again, the word itself is like a sound. It's like something that happens in the bulk figure or texture and motion of the minute particles of the air or whatever. But, um, but the, the rule, as I said, is like we're allowed to think the word when we think the, the idea and vice versa, right? Like it's, so it's the idea of that sound, the way it sounds to us. So like, you know, if this is the idea white, the simple idea of that color, and this is the idea of the sound white, so we have a rule that you're allowed to substitute one for the other in certain situations, or required to even. And um, and when I talked about that, I you know I claimed that that rule uh, or that permission or requirement is like uh, strictly speaking like an ethical uh, requirement according to Locke. It's a convention we voluntarily bound ourselves to in order to allow human society to exist, and therefore we're like we've agreed to compel to comply with it. So we're like we're bound by it. It's like a covenant we formed with other speakers. Um, but I mean, whatever the nature, uh, the like source of obligation of the rule is, so to speak, it's a rule about how signs, like what order they should come in. It's a rule about the relationship between signs, between the the idea of the word and the idea of the thing, and how we're allowed to or required to interchange them. As opposed to, according to Locke, um, uh, the relation, the rule that connects this idea of white to the quality of white, whiteness in the external body. That's a semantic relation, right? The, qual the quality of whiteness in the external body is not one of my signs. I can't decide when to put it there or when not to put it there. Um, I can't have this kind of uh, convention about when it's going to be there or not. Um, it's something that's outside of my language. But nevertheless, uh, there's a rule that connects. So that rule is not my voluntary rule, right? That rule is like part of the laws of nature or as established by God or something like that. Um, so, and I think I said this before, actually, I'm not sure if I said this before or not. It's hard to remember. Um, I should probably listen, no, I don't listen to, listen to la lecture from last time every time before I should any lecture. But, um, Right, so anyway, whether I said this before or not, Barclay basically only believes in these syntactic rules, not in the semantic rules. At least that's a, uh, that's a first approximation. We'll see that it's not exactly true. He does believe in a kind of semantic connection between ideas and things that are not ideas. Um, but it's quite different from the one Locke thinks there is. Um, so, you know, this issue came up already when, um, uh, in last week's reading, when Barclay traces the origin of Locke's error about abstract ideas to a mistake about language. Um... Right, so Locke said, um, well, how can there be general names? Um, well, uh, the general name, like the name white, for example, if we take white to mean a white, like a white thing, the white, <laughs> right? So like general names like white, um, have to be the names for many different possible things. 
So how does that work? Well, you know, as names, all they can have is a syntactic connection to some idea. Now the idea, um, on the other hand, has to somehow um, make a connection between this general name and all these different possible things. So Locke says the idea must be a general idea. And therefore, it must be an abstract idea, right? It can't be the um, um, most fundamentally, it can't be tied to a particular time and place. So that has to have been separated from the particular idea in order to make an abstract idea of white. Um, So Barclay wants to explain how it is that there are no general ideas, and yet there can nevertheless be general names. So how does that work, right? So um, this is what Barclay says about it. Um, this is in introduction section 19 on page 18. Um, This is how general names work. Names being for the most part used as letters in algebra, in which, though a particular quantity be marked by each letter, yet to proceed right it is not requisite that in every step each letter suggests to your thoughts that particular quantity it was appointed to stand for. So I think the way he's thinking about this, although the way he describes it is a little bit funny given, but I think the way he's thinking about how algebra works is um, so I go through some algebraic reason, use, reasoning using the general sign x. The sign x signs for any number, right? So like I write, you know, x plus 3 equals 7 and then x plus 3 minus 3 equals 7 minus 3 and x plus 0 equals 4 and therefore x equals 4. Now, um, um, what makes x significant as I go through this, what makes the sign x meaningful as I go through this process? Um, not that um, I always, every time I see the sign X, I'm referred to something outside my language. Um, but just because the rules I have for proceeding correctly, and they're basically syntactic rules, Right? There's, there are rules for you know, combining signs and changing their order and stuff like that. The rules that I have proceeding correctly um, guarantee that um, in the end, I'll get a rule that lets me replace x with the sign of a particular number. At least if the problem is solvable, right? if it's solvable by algebraic means or whatever. So, right, that, that if, I, if I proceed correctly, I'll get to a line like this, and this line tells me that now, you know, I can switch x, I can, I can switch x for 4, right? So, like, if I started off, you know, with saying, um, uh, have three apples and I want seven apples, how many more apples do I need? And I can say, well, call the number of apples I need x, go through this thing, then I say I can switch x for four, so I go back and say call the number of apples I need four, and then I have the solution to the problem. 
um, and X is a general sign because depending on the context, I'll get a different um, thing that I'm allowed to exchange it for. Right, that it will, be, it will be correctly replaced by different particular numbers in different contexts. Um, so, um, applying this same understanding to general names, to how general names work, um, so Barclay says, this is back on page 12 in section 11. Um, but it seems that a word becomes general by being made the sign, not of an abstract general idea, but of several particular ideas, any of which it indefinitely suggests to the mind. Now, I think when he says any of which it indifferently suggests to the mind, of course, uh, he doesn't mean that in a particular context suggests any number of different things indifferently to the mind. He means that uh, which thing it suggests to the mind, which particular thing it suggests to the mind is going gonna, is gonna to depend on the context just the way which particular number is associated with X is going to depend on the context. But, um, you know, there are rules, that is, syntactic rules, uh, under which I can replace the certain ideas with the name white, and then um, I can go through various reasonings using the name white. I don't know what reasonings I could use the name white, but suppose the word is triangle, you know, you can understand better maybe. Um, or, I mean, for that matter, the name four also basically works this way. According, I mean, we, I call this a particular number, but it's really a name for four or anything, I think is, is the way Barclay thinks of it. Um, so anyway, you know, um, I can go through various reasonings with that word triangle or white or whatever it is. And then um, the result I get will be general in the sense that, you know, um, when I switch contexts, I'll then be able to, you know, substitute a different particular thing for the word white. But the conclusion will still be true. This isn't, this algebraic example does not exactly parallel to that, I now realize. I should try to make it better. Um, but, so, do you understand basically other questions about, um, again, the way Locke thinks a, a general name signifies is that every time I have the general name, I can exchange it for a general idea. And the general idea is not the idea of any particular thing. It's the idea of many particular things. Um, so, um, um, so it's like um, the general name is general because it stands for thinking something general. And that's a supposed semantic relation between this idea and all these other things. And Barclay says, no, there's no general ideas. The way it works, the way a general name works is that um, it signifies various particular ideas in the syntactic sense that I'm allowed to write down various particular ideas, that is, have them in my mind, in, right, write them down inside my mind, um, instead of the idea of that sound, and vice versa. Right, so just like you could say here, you know, X signifies any number whatsoever, then you could also say here, X signifies four. You know, that means that in this case, we got the result that you can substitute x for 4. 
but in other cases, it could be something else. It has nothing to do with the relationship between X and things outside the language. Um, now, um, there's one more thing to say about this, and it's important. I mean, it's so... As soon as you hear this, you may think of an objection, and uh, many people, including Thomas Reed, uh, the founder of Scottish common sense philosophy, took this objection or something like it to be decisive. Um, the, and I, I guess to put the uh, to put the objection best, I guess I put it something like this: Well, okay, so suppose I have this word white. And now I encounter a new thing I've never encountered before. How do I know whether this new thing that I've never encountered before uh, stands under this syntactic rule that I can exchange it with my word white or not? So I can't do it by comparing it with the word. Right? Because the word is an arbitrary sign. Locke and Barclay agree about that. And it's, I mean, although there are people who don't agree about that, it's not an easy position to take, right? Because it seems like there's different languages and they use completely different sounds for the same thing. So, um, uh, right? So, like, the, so the word white is an arbitrary sound. So there's no relationship between the word white and the things that are or are not white. So if I just compare the sound to this new thing, there's no way of telling from that whether the new thing is going to be exchangeable for the word or not. Well, could I do it maybe by comparing it with some other thing that is exchangeable for the word? Well, the problem is, like, remember, a lot of other things are exchangeable for the word. Depending on which one I pick, it seems uh, likely that I'll get a different answer. Anyway, there doesn't, there's no proof that I won't, right? So in other words, I find this new thing. I want to know if the word white applies to it. So I know that the snowball I saw yesterday, remember, these are all particulars, right? It's like not snowballs in general. I know that the snowball I saw yesterday was exchangeable with white, syntactically exchangeable with white. And I know that the glass of the milk I saw yesterday in a glass on the table was exchangeable with white. So now I take this new thing and I'm going to compare it with one of those. But those two things are completely different. They're just, they're different particular things. So who says that it's not going to kind of like strike me as like one of them, but not like the other one? And in that case, how do I decide which one, <laughs> right? So, um, so like the, the, the objection then is, it seems like somewhere there must be something that's actually universal or general that I'm using to make this decision, right? Like I have to say, okay, what do those two things have in common that they don't have in common in every, with everything else? Well, it's their whiteness. And then I ask whether this new thing has that or not. But that's an abstract general idea, it seems like, right? So it seems like one way or another, the universal that Barclay is trying to get rid of is going to come back. I mean, not to mention that, of course, the, the word white is like every time I hear or imagine the sound, that sound is a different particular thing. Right? So how do I even know it's the same word again? Um, don't I have to have a general abstract idea of the word white to say, oh, here's the word white again? Meaning, not that it's identical, but that it has something in common with all the other instances of the word white. So it allows me to recognize it again. So, um, 
So in other words, it seems that like a sign can't have a syntactic value. Uh, that is, it seems like there can't be syntactic rules unless I'm capable of forming abstract general ideas. So, I mean, that, is it, are there questions about that objection? Like I said, I think, well, I don't know. It seems like the history of philosophy, at least in Scotland in the late 18th and early 19th century is like, but I guess it's not just there. It's been divided because the same thing happens with Hobbes and like has been divided between people who like automatically notice this objection and say, look, this doctrine is ridiculous. And people who are, who are like, I don't understand, what's the objection? <laughs> so if you're in the second group, then you may not appreciate what I want to say now. But I, because I think Barclay actually does have an answer to it. I'm not sure if Hobbes does, but Barclay does. So that is, so according to Barclay, yes, there is something really general. But the thing that's really general is not an idea. What is it? Well, it's a principle of my will. That is, it's um, an active power of what Barclay calls a spirit. So, um, so what backs the syntactic rules up um, is not some general ideas that apply to signs that I then use to decide how to arrange the signs. Rather, I just decide how to use them. I don't use other signs to decide that, right? And that decision is universal, but it's not an idea or or like any idea. Um, okay, but hold on a second. This is another objection that might occur to you right away. If this thing is not an idea or like an idea, how can we talk about it? Oh, someone has their hand up. I didn't. I don't know how long that was true, but. No, 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 just for a minute here. Um, I was just going to ask, for for uh, Barclay, the spirit is an individual thing, right? Yeah. Like the, the individual spirit. What? Like the individual spirit. There's just a singular person quote we're talking about. Right, like I'm a spirit, you're a spirit. Okay. There are many okay. finite spirits. How I know that there are other finite spirits is a good question. But anyway, there are many finite spirits, and there's one infinite spirit, which is God. Okay, all right. Right. So, um, um, right. so in other words, as in Locke, in Berkeley, too, language is, is primarily an individual thing, right? Like, it's through my volition that my words come to signify something the fact that you know then of course i have to find a way to line that up with everyone else's or also also i have to find a way to line that up with god's will which i'll talk about later but um um but it's basically like my decision right so but again like my a decision is an operation or action of a spirit, and it's therefore it's not an idea or like an idea. And the question I just asked is, well, if it's not an idea like an idea, how can we have a word that means it? Right? It can't be like this. So, like, how can the word spirit or the word will or the word decision or any of these words I'm using have a meaning? So, well, and part of the reason I, I asked that question, yeah. Abe, is just because of, like, the the completely different use of the term in, in Hegel, which, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a test that no one, you know, is... Yeah, it's uh, not but, a 
it's not completely different, but yeah, it's different. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so, Hegel I also talks about finite spirit at some point in the uh, system, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not the spirit. Uh, they, I yeah. mean, you, maybe you could call Barclay's God that, but that's he doesn't. He just calls yeah. God an infinite spirit or the infinite spirit. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, this is the same way Locke used the word spirit, by the way. Right? According to Locke, there's two types of substances, bodies or corporeal substances and spirits or spiritual substances. Barclay is denying that there are corporeal substances and saying there are only spiritual substances, meaning there are spirits. Right. So, um, um, right. So again, the question is, how can we talk about this? And the answer, I think, roughly speaking, is that um, that strictly is the only thing we ever talk about. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the semantic significance of every sign is the will of a spirit, right? The thing that every sign refers to that's outside of the system of signs is, um, the will of a spirit. So, like, if I imagine the word white, hearing the word white, and then following this rule, I proceed to imagine some particular white thing, um, both of those, this idea and this idea, are expressions of my will. So, um, this is also why, according to Barclay, Locke is wrong to think that the only significant use of language is to communicate ideas, right? Remember, Bar Locke thought that the the proper use of language, the, the use in which it was significant and socially useful and possibly true and all these things, was to use it to like um, it express the fact that I have a certain idea and get you to have that same idea. Um, but um, according to Barclay, actually, where is the difference here exactly? This might not be quite the right way to, to, to say it, but anyway, I, but I think it will give you the right um, idea, so to speak. <laughs> um, that, that on the contrary, according to Barclay, the fundamental use of language is to express my will and affect your will. And the, the use of language where it communicates ideas is just a means to that. Um, so, like, for example, if I say, give me the goal, Right, so, um, and then you give me some gold, <laughs> then maybe that works by the fact that I imagine some gold that I want, I exchange it in my mind for the word gold, the idea of the word gold, and I use that to produce the sound, you hear the sound, get the idea of the word gold, exchange it for the idea of gold, and then consulting that idea, you realize, oh, he wants that, and you give me that, right? But the truth is, I don't care if it works that way or not, <laughs> right? That's all just a complicated way of getting the gold. If it gets you to give it to me some other way, then that's fine. <laughs> um, and um, in the case of some words, for example, spirit, Barclay is going to say, it doesn't, never works by means of an idea. Right? So when I th say things about spirit, I'm expressing my will as a spirit, and I'm affecting your will as a spirit, or I'm aiming to, 
but not by ex I'm not aiming to do it by exciting a certain idea in you. Okay, um, so that's kind of like what I want to say about the preliminary things I wanted to say about language. We'll see this syntax semantics thing coming back. Are there questions before I go on? Okay, so now I'm going to introduce Barclay's idealism. But at first, I'm just going to write it down as, or write in a say it as um, like assertions <laughs> without explaining why anyone would think this, basically. Um, right, so. Um, So, I mean, that is, what I write here is going to be an argument, but I'm not backing up any of the premises of the argument or something like that. So the, so, so the first thing is he, that he thinks that an idea um, is something that can't exist on its own. That is, it's an accident or mode. Um, I don't know if this, if we've said enough about substances and accidents or modes in discussing Locke to make it clear to you why these, why the parentheses applies, but. Um, but just take my word for it anyway, those two are supposed to, be, supposed to be the same thing, right? So in other words, when he says that ideas are merely accidents or modes, not substances, he means they're things that can't exist on their own, but only in something else. And the second step is that Rather, its mode of being is to exist in a mind. Okay, so I mean, so far Locke agrees with this. Ideas are not substances. They don't exist on their own. Whatever they are, they're, um, you know, modes of a thinking thing. Uh, they exist in our mind. But then this step, Locke will not agree with. This is the only kind of inexistence we understand. Right, the only way we understand of something existing in something else is for an idea exist to exist in a mind. So, um, right, and of course, Locke doesn't agree with that, right? Because he thinks we can understand how real qualities exist in a body, namely the primary qualities. And when I say he thinks we can understand, I mean, you know, remember, Locke is kind of, uh, uh, when we talk about substance and inherence in a substance in general, Locke says, yeah, actually that's a something we know not what. Um, but, um, but Locke thinks that we do know two particular instances of it, and we have at least a relative idea of each of those, and 
we know that there's a resemblance between the two. Whereas Barclay is saying, no, we only know one example. We can't conceive of any other example. So therefore, um, we can't conceive of an idea or anything like an idea except as existing in a mind. And that's the idealist conclusion. And it's, it's, it's uh, strong. It's what Kant calls dogmatic idealism. It doesn't just say, you know, for all we know, there's nothing like our ideas existing outside of a mind. It says, we can't conceive of anything like our ideas existing except in a mind. Therefore, um, the, the thing that Locke thinks we can conceive, uh, a substance that is not a mind, but rather a body, is not dubious, like, well, maybe there's such a thing or maybe there isn't. It's absurd. There couldn't, we, we, we literally are not thinking about anything when we think that, because it involves, as Barclay says, a manifest contradiction. We say, you know, it's something that resembles our ideas, but we also say it's, it's not in a mind, and that's a contradiction, according to Barclay. Okay, so um, so like I said, I want I mean I wanted to write that up to begin with, just to, to see what the thesis is we're heading for, and also because I often run out of time, so I want to make sure I got it all of that at least written up there that that's what Barclay thinks. Um, so Barclay thinks you know. Um, there are substances and accidents or modifications of substances, but the substances are all spirits and the modifications are all ideas of spirits. Um, okay, so, but I'm gonna erase this now. Is it okay if I erase the, well, you can always rewind the, well, I don't know. Is it okay if I erase this now? I had a bigger board, I would leave it up. Um, so I'm so I'm gonna try to come back and explain what Barclay actually means by all that stuff and why he thinks we should believe it. Um, right? Like it's not obvious to begin with what it that he has a right to even say that stuff, let alone why we should believe it. Um, you know, what is he talking about when he talks about the inexistence of an idea in a spirit that is a mind? I guess I switched from spirit to mind there. I hope that wasn't too confusing. Barclay uses the terms interchangeably. Um, okay, but before that, I want to make sure it's clear about what the theory is and what it isn't. So... Um, because, you know, so the opposite of idealism is realism. Now, I know before I talked about the opposition between nominalism and realism, this is a completely different opposition. Uh, the realism gets used in both of them. I mean, there's some relationship between them, but still, and definitely there's some relationship between them in Barclay, but still it's a completely different opposition. It's just, you know, as usual, realism, real, comes from the word race, meaning thing. 
right? So idea, so realism is the you know view that there are both ideas and things, whereas idealism is the view that there are only ideas. Um, so, um, so of course, Berkeley therefore is not a realist if by realist you mean what Locke means by it, right? So if you mean that there's something like our ideas, um, uh, which is not itself an idea and not itself in a spirit, in a mind, then Berkeley says, no, that's absurd. But of course, um, Berkeley would be considered insane if he said there were no things, <laughs> right? I mean, of course, we know there are things, you know, like, here's one, this pen. <laughs> That's a thing. What do you say about that, Berkeley? Right? And, or, or another way of putting the objection is, um, and this is the way Barclay considers it. Um, look, there's a big difference between things and mere ideas. Here's a thing. It's really different to, to have this thing here and just to imagine it. I can imagine all kinds of stuff. Chimeras, you know, like actual chimeras. Actually, I always forget what the pieces that make a chimera is. So I don't are so I, I can't really imagine one, but <laughs> um, I think it has a snake in the middle and a goat at the I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, so but you know I can imagine unicorns. I can imagine uh, you know an ice cream sundae right here. I guess I'm <laughs> feeling hungry. To use that example. Um, so you know, and we all know there's a big difference between mere ideas and things. So. Um, So Barclay's response to that is going to be, and you know, what I'm doing now is is an example of what I'm kind of in the middle of doing right now is an example of what the second writing assignment is going to ask you to do. So if you don't understand what the second writing assignment is asking you to do, you can think, oh, it's that same thing. I didn't understand him when he was doing a class. But anyway, so, right, so Barclay's response to that is going to be, oh, well, you know, I'm talking, before when I said there are no things, that is, I'm against realism, I meant there's no things in the way, like metaphysicians, like Aristotelians or Locke, who unfortunately was still a metaphysician in this sense, according to Berkeley, right? The, the way these bad philosophers used the word thing, not only did I not deny there are things, but I think they're absurd. But on the other hand, the way we use the word thing in everyday life is perfectly good. It's just you have to you have to realize that it doesn't mean what those philosophers think it does. So I'm going to explain to you what the actual like everyday common sense distinction we make between things and mere ideas amounts to. Um, so I mean this is a little bit confusing because it means that basically. Um, Barclay is going to divide ideas into two parts, and one part is called things, and the other part is called ideas more properly speaking, or mere ideas, or the, that is, the things that, according to common sense in everyday life, we call mere ideas, figments of the imagination, stuff like that. Um, right? So he says, actually, these are these are not some mysterious thing outside the mind that the ideas refer to. These are just a particular type of ideas. And he says, yeah, it's weird to call them ideas, but he, you know, he has a whole thing about why, 
um, he wants to use that somewhat harsh terminology or whatever. So, um, right, I mean, he says, look, I mean, basically, this is why. He says, what these things have in common is that they're all just modifications of spirits or minds. So, you know, to remind ourselves of that, it's best to call them all ideas. But, you know, but the truth is, yes, there's a big difference between mere ideas and things as we ordinarily use those words. Actually, there's, um, well, so first of all, he says um, his general definition of a thing that I already read last time, I believe. Um, in section one of part one on page 23. As several of these, so before this he's been talking about sensible ideas like smell, taste, color, whatever, and as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name and so to be reputed as one thing. Right, so first of all, thing is the name um, we call we call something a thing when we have a, a special name for the particular collection of ideas that come together in it, or not in it, but that come together there, now, right? So in other words, I say, like, um, an apple is a thing, and, you know, I mean by that, that, um, um, I use the name apple when I observe a certain combination of ideas coming together, a certain color, a certain shape, a certain smell, a certain taste. I say, there's an apple. So, I mean, um, so like all the apple is, is a certain collection of ideas. But now, of course, you know, although this is one way of explaining how you use the word thing, that still has not made this division, right? Because an imaginary apple is also a collection of those same ideas, right? If I imagine or remember an apple, um, it's going to be that same color, shape, smell, taste, whatever. Um, so, you know, the distinction we really want to make is between real things and mere ideas. Now, real things, since real comes from race, is like kind of redundant. It means thing thing, <laughs> right? But um, um, in any case, uh, um, it's necessary to distinguish between this this definition of thing which just says there's certain ideas collected together and a stronger definition of thing in which it's opposed to any mere idea or figment of imagination so and uh so what draws this difference here and barclay says well there's basically three differences between things and mere ideas. So things are composed of ideas that are, first of all, not subject to my will. Right? So like before when I was talking about how the, if I imagine white, or if I imagine the word white, those, those ideas are expressions of my will as a spirit. Um, and therefore I call them mere ideas, or I say I imagine them, right? Whereas um, if I see a snowball, that's not an expression of my will. I got those. I got some ideas, you know, white, round, etc., but not by my will. 
So that's one distinction between something imaginary and something real. Second of all, they're composed of ideas that are more strong or lively. Right, imagining, when you imagine a snowball, you kind of see the white and feel the cold and see the shape, but it's not. And I mean, Barclay and Hume kind of struggle to describe what it's not or like what is characteristic of it. Because it's not like, it's not like it's less pure white than a real snowball. It's just as white as a real snowball, but somehow that whiteness is like washed out because you don't really see it. You're just imagining it. See, I mean, I think you can kind of understand what he's getting at, even uh, though it's a little suspicious that it's hard to describe it. But, okay, so in any case, so that's another difference. And the third difference is that the ideas that compose real things are more regular. Now, um, this is a little bit complicated to, I mean, and we'll see in Hume how, like, this develops complications when you try to explain it precisely. But you can, I think you can get the general idea what he's talking about. You know, like, the sun rises every morning um, uh, and sets every evening. Um, it never appears in the middle of the night. But I can imagine the sun in the middle of the night. Right? Like, I, I can't actually have a snowball here now because it's not cold enough to have a snowball here now. Um, at least I couldn't have one for long, right? So there's a regularity to where real snowballs are or are not. But um, I can imagine a snowball anytime I want. Well, maybe not anytime I want. But so, I mean, but that's why he says it's more regular. Right? I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it might be harder to imagine a snowball if I'm really hot or if I'm, you know, on the rack. <laughs> it's a lot of use that example. You know, you try to distract yourself from the pain of torture by imagining a snowball. It's probably not going to work. You, you won't be it. You know, whatever. So there are regularities, but it's more regular. The, these, the ideas that compose these real things are more regular than these. And furthermore, Barclay um, um, makes some connection between, I don't know if any of that, what I scrawled here is readable. Not subject to my will. This should be obvious, but I know it's probably not. But if I write something on the board and you cannot read it and you and you don't and you, you couldn't catch what I was saying, to, you know, you should ask, what does that say? <laughs> um, all right. I'm aware that what I write is not necessarily legible. But anyway, so Barclay seems to draw a connection between these two. When he says, um, this is in section 30 of part one on page 35. That is not right. Section 30 is not on page 35. It's on page 34. Okay. The ideas of sense, right? So I guess I didn't say that yet, but you know, to collect all these together, we can say real things are composed of sensations, ideas of sense, 
whereas imaginary things are composed of ideas of imagination, right? And this is the difference. Ideas of sense are not, oh, you can't see the board. This is the difference. Ideas of sense are not subject to my will, more strong or lively, and more regular. Right? So, sorry. So getting back to this. The ideas of sense are more strong, lively, and distinct than those of the imagination. They have likewise a steadiness, order, and coherence, and are not excited at random, as those which are the effects of human wills often are, but in a regular train or series, the admirable connection whereof sufficiently testifies the wisdom and benevolence of its author. Right, I, I kind of, that, the last part, maybe I shouldn't have read that yet, it's kind of a spoiler, but in any case, you know, so he's saying, like, the reason these are more regular, and probably also the reason they're more strong or lively, is that my will is not that strong. So the, the, Ideas that are subject to my will, I mean, I guess it's the other way around, right? The ideas that are subject to my will are weak and irregular because my will is weak and irregular. But then there's these other ideas that are strong and regular. They must be the effect of a stronger and more regular will. And, um, of course, he's going to say that they're the effects of the divine will. Um, right? So another, so like all of these differences between real things and mere ideas are going to turn out to be symptoms of, I guess, what you would say is the big difference, namely that um, the all ideas express the will of some spirit, but these ideas express my will, whereas these ideas express God's will. And, you know, so it's worth emphasizing these are, you know, I mean, they're not somehow like ghostly. I mean, these are, that's kind of what he's trying to capture and saying that they're, they're not as strong or lively. But these are not, these are like big, solid, colorful, all those things, right? But the point is that um, big, solid, colorful things are not separated from our minds. They're the immediate objects of our minds. As he says in section 38 on page 37, right, someone objects that um, it sounds strange to say that we are fed and clothed by ideas, right? Again, because they're thinking ideas are kind of a flimsy mental thing. How can I eat them or put them on or whatever? And Barclay says, um, yeah, it sounds a little weird, but, but what it's saying is what you already believe and what common sense teaches you. Namely, we are fed and clothed with those things which we perceive immediately by our senses. Not by, as Locke would say, some other thing that they represent. Right? So as Locke says, you know, um, when, I, when I feel the apple in my mouth and taste the apple and all of that stuff, I'm not feeling or tasting the thing that is actually fe uh, feeding me. I'm feeling or tasting a representative of it, an idea. But the thing that's actually feeding me is something outside my mind that, that resembles that. So Barclay is saying, no, it's that very thing that you taste. That's the thing that you're getting your nutrition from. 
So it's Locke who's saying something weird. <laughs> this is Clint, not me. Locke is trying to tell you something that you would never think of if it weren't for this bad philosophy you learned. Okay, so, um, so all of that is by way of explaining, and I know because someone, I mean, I was planning to do this anyway, but I know someone asked me in office hours, like, uh, doesn't Locke, doesn't Barclay kind of contradict himself because he first, he says that there's no real things. And then he says that real things are different from ideas and what's going on here. So it's not a contradiction. He's saying that, you know, um, um, yes, there are things. Are, we use our word thing for a perfectly good purpose, and here's what it is, and it makes perfect sense. And when you use it that way, I'm not denying anything that you usually believe, is his claim. I'm not denying that, you know, there's something solid that you feel and something colorful that you see, you know, like all those things I'm not denying. And I'm not denying that that's completely different from just imagining that stuff. What I am denying, he says, the kind of realism I'm, I'm denying is something that no one really believes, uh, you know, except some philosophers persuade themselves or other people that they believe it even, but it's, it's, a contradiction in terms. It's absurd. Um, okay, other questions about that before I go on? Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is a little bit of a digression, but it's, it's an important digression. Now, I mean, well, um, does God always perceive everything? Um, So, um, you know, Barclay does not say this, does not say that in this book. At one point in his uh, dialogues, uh, the character who represents him seems to explicitly say something like this. But Barclay, in this book, the closest he comes is that he implies that it's a possible explanation and what is a possible explanation for? Well, it's a possible explanation for um, why, how it could be that things exist even when we're not perceiving them, right? So you notice, like, I mean, um, he said we're not, he's not denying anything that we usually believe by common sense. But, you know, so when I close my eyes, like suppose I'm looking at the pen. So the pen, according to Barclay, is composed of ideas of sense. So when I close my eyes, well, I can still feel it, but suppose it was on the table and I can't feel it either. So I close my eyes. Now I don't perceive the pen at all. So where is the pen, right? So according to Locke, it's the pen is where it always was in the world of bodies, and I just stopped. It's just stopped causing me to perceive ideas, but the pen hasn't changed. But according to Barclay, the pen was those ideas. So I close my eyes, the pen is gone, right? Like the pen is annihilated. It's been reduced to it's been reduced to nothing um, instantaneously. <laughs> um, so that doesn't sound very commonsensical. <laughs> Um, and as a way of explaining why maybe it's not as bad as you think, um, Barclay in a couple places hints, um,
Right. So he says, you know, the choir of heaven and blah, 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 everything, all the things that Locke thinks of as bodies have not any subsistence without a mind, that their being is to be perceived or known, that consequently, so long as they are not actually perceived by me or do not exist in my mind or that of any, these are the same thing, right? Perceived by me equals exist in my mind. Because again, remember, these things are composed of ideas of sensation. So, uh, is, um, so long as they are not actually perceived by me, that is, do not exist in my mind, or that of any other created spirit. Right? So no one else is looking at the pen either. They must either have no existence at all, or else subsist in the mind of some eternal spirit. Right? So he's allowing this kind of loophole, you know, suppose we, suppose I close my eyes, where did the pen go? Well, maybe someone else sees the pen. So the pen still exists. Is it really the same pen? It's not the same set of sense, right, collection of sensible ideas. Because they see it from a different point of view and whatever. But anyway, you know, okay, say the pen still exists because someone else sees it. All right, but what if no one sees it? Does it now, now is the pen annihilated? And then, so Barclay is hinting, you can say, well, no, it's not because God sees it still. And God always sees it, so it will never be annihilated. Now, um, and he hints at this even more strongly later on, I think. Um... And this is, um, that is the view that, that's a view that not only usually is attributed to Barclay, but it's kind of like the one thing people know about Barclay, <laughs> right? So, like, if you say Barclay, um, people will be like, oh, yeah, you know, the tree only exists because God perceives it. Um... But like I said, uh, you know, Barclay doesn't come out and claim that in this book, actually. He kind of just hints at it as something that you could say. Um, and um, he's, it certainly doesn't seem like it could be a very important part of his view, or else he would have to develop it at length, right? It would be so important. That's why the world exists, because God is always perceiving it. He, all he says is, well, maybe you could say it still exists because God is perceiving it. But the truth is, I think, and I noticed this is like, for some reason, I've had this edition for so many years, but this is the first time I looked to see what the uh, editor, Kenneth Winkler, wrote in the introduction. And I noticed that he also sa says something like what I'm about to say, um, that it doesn't seem like Barclay literally meant, literally thought this was true. So, I mean, I'm not going to give you all my reasons for that. I think I have good reasons, but I'm also recognized that I'll run out of time if I go farther on this digression. And it's not that important because, like I said, I, Barclay doesn't talk about it. The only reason I'm talking about it is if you look up Barclay in anywhere, you're, you know, you're going to see Barclay thinks that God perceives the world all the time, and that's why it exists. So I just want to say, like, at least as far as... I, like, I don't think Barclay thinks that. <laughs> um, so, of course, Barclay thinks something exists even when I'm not perceiving the pen. Something exists outside my mind even when I'm not perceiving the pen. And in a certain sense, it's the same thing that Locke thinks still exists even when I'm not perceiving the pen. Namely... So, you know, here's my mind, or spirit. And here's, you know, I'm trying to draw a chip on the pen, but I don't know. But anyway, so, let me just try like this. So here's the collection of um, sensations or ideas of sense that Locke would call the idea of the pen, whereas Barclay calls it the pen, <laughs> right? So, you know, here's the pen. 
or idea of the pen, according to Locke. So now when I close my eyes, this is gone. But what is still there, according to Locke? Well, what's still there is there's a substance. And in the substance is a power or powers that under the correct conditions will cause me to perceive this idea. So I close my eyes the con and the conditions no longer hold and the substance stops causing me to perceive the idea, but the substance and its powers are still there, right? So there's a substance and powers and the powers are what Locke calls the qualities, right? So if the pen is white, that so that is Locke will say the idea of the pen includes um, the the idea of white, whereas Barclay will say the pen is made up among other things of the idea of of a of white, right, or of a white idea. I guess it's not the abstract idea of white, of course. Um, it's not according to Locke either. Really, in this case, it's a, this is the idea of a particular pen. So anyway, um, so, so the, you know, if there's this white idea, then there must be a white quality in the substance, a quality of whiteness, which is the power to cause me to perceive the idea. Well, so, you know, according to Barclay, there also is something outside me that has the power to cause me to perceive this idea. Only, according to Barclay, that thing is... God, right? According to Locke, it was, for example, the snowball. But according to Barclay, it's God. God has the power to cause me to, to perceive this pen. And God will cause me to perceive it in proper circumstances and not in other circumstances. So when I close my eyes, God will stop causing me to perceive the pen. Um... When I open them again, God will cause me to perceive the pen again. So what's the difference between them then? They both agree that there's an ex a substance external to my mind that exists even when I close my, my eyes that has the power to cause me to perceive those ideas. And the difference is that Locke thinks this substance resembles my idea and Barclay thinks it doesn't. So it's a thing that isn't like any idea, according to Barclay. That is, it's a spirit, right? It's always a spirit. Sometimes he talks as if other finite spirits can cause ideas in me. But, um, but I think when he describes it more carefully, it's always what they do is cause ideas in their own mind. But it's, you know then um, thanks to that, God causes certain sensations in me, right? So they don't affect me directly. They affect me by way of the divine will. Um, so it's, it's really always the same spirit behind my ideas of sense, namely God. But, that's, but, but the main point is whatever spirit it is, it can't resemble this idea because a spirit never resembles an idea. Okay, um, so there are questions about that so far, right? So, so again, what I'm saying is that, you know, um, God's role here is not to perceive the pen when I'm not perceiving it. God's role is, so to speak, to be the pen, <laughs> Right? That is, to be the substance that has the power to, to make me perceive a pen. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about what a spirit is and why it's not like an idea. And then... Ooh.
Well, I think I already said most of this before, actually. Um, yeah, in fact, I'm just going to summarize what I said before and go on to the next part, which is the argument against the existence of matter or bodies. Now, again, of course, Barclay doesn't deny that there are bodies, like, for example, this pen, <laughs> right? He denies that there are corporeal substances. That is, he denies that there are substances that are not spirits, that our ideas resemble. And that when we talk about the pen, we're talking about one of those. He says, no, when we're talking about the pen, we're talking about, for example, the ideas that I'm having right now. Okay. So anyway, um, um, so I mean, I think what I already talked about before is um, what it means to say a spirit is not an idea. A spirit is not an idea means that um, the word spirit, um, well, so actually, let me at least read this. I said I was going to skip this, but let me read this one thing. So this is section 27 at the bottom of page 33. Um, now, this is something that he added in the second edition, the 1734 edition. That's why the editor put it in brackets here. Um, but I think he thought this already in 1710, because there's other places in the book where he says something like this, even in 1710. Though it must be owned at the same time that we have some notion of soul, spirit, and the operations of the mind, such as willing, loving, hating, inasmuch as we know or understand the meaning of those words. Right? So again, like if you say, well, Barclay, we have no, uh, if we have no idea um, uh, of a soul or spirit or mind, then um, how can we talk about it? Barclay says, well, we do understand the meaning of those words. And, you know, you might think that that's kind of a um, really insufficient reply. What do you mean we understand the meaning of those words? Isn't the meaning of the word an idea? So that's why I went through that whole thing at the beginning about language. Barclay is saying, um, you know, we know how to use those words to express our will and affect the will of others. And that, strictly speaking, is knowing the meaning of a word. <laughs> Being able to exchange it syntactically for an idea is, you know, just a means to that end. So a spirit is not an idea. It just means that spirit is a word that doesn't signify by being associated by, with an idea. But the more important question is, and the one that needs to be made out in order to, ex to explain Barclay's idealism. So remember, like one step in that was we don't understand any other kind of inexistence. We don't understand how, uh, how else something could be a substance and have powers other than by being a spirit. So the important point is has to be that not only is a spirit not an idea but it's not like any idea so um well actually maybe it's not clear why that's the important part but i think as i go through the argument you'll see why so here is this is my version of, our, of Barclay's argument against the existence of matter.
and um, it's a pretty abstract version of it. So I mean, it may, it might be hard to recognize this as, as Barclay's argument, but I think this is the way to put it to make the most sense of it. So so okay, so it starts with this. First of all, Locke thinks we can conceive of substances that resemble our ideas. Which ideas? They resemble our ideas of extension, solidity, or that, as I say, have modes, have real powers that resemble our ideas of extension, solidity, shape, that is the primary qualities. So those are corporeal substances, bodies. Right? Because that's what the primary qualities are. They're the qualities of bodies as such. Right? So according to Locke, um, this is the way I explained how that works. Here's an external substance. How can we check if it resembles our ideas or not? We can't, again, like go around behind the ideas and look at it directly then it would be an idea. It would be the immediate object of the mind. So the question is, how can we, on what basis can we say that the immediate objects resemble this external object? Um, and my explanation was, went by the fact that Locke says that in the case only of certain primary qualities, there are visible necessary connections between distinct ideas. And um, because of these necessary connections between the ideas, we know of some necessary connections between the powers of the external substance. And that's the sense in which the external substance, um, insofar as it's the subject of tangible qualities, the qualities that cause the feeling of solidity, shape, figure, etc., tangible primary qualities, that in the, insofar as it's the subject of those qualities, it resembles our ideas of it. So I think the basic thing that Barclay thinks is, is wrong or absurd about this is this visible necessary connection. And what does he think is wrong with it? So I think what he thinks is wrong with it is that if I say, um, that given A, we necessarily get B. Um, that must mean that A has the power to produce B. I mean, I guess it could mean B has the power to produce A, but in any case, right, the necessitation can only be understood in terms of activity. <laughs> Now, I mean, Barclay doesn't say that in so many words anywhere, uh, but I think that's what he's thinking. And therefore, see, on Locke's picture, this visible necessary connection um, is like an, a kind of inert necessitation. Right? These ideas don't produce each other. Because Locke agrees with Barclay, the idea doesn't have a power. There's a power in the external object to produce the idea. The idea itself doesn't have a power to produce other ideas. So, um, um, and yet, he needs that in order to represent, to, in order for this to resemble 
the actual relationship there's supposed to be between these powers, which presumably do actively necessitate each other. Right, so it's this kind of inert necess necessity or necessitation that Barclay thinks is absurd, I think. Now, then, you know, remember that if you say to Barclay, oh, yeah, well, then how come you can't have figure without extension, et cetera, et cetera, Barclay will say, well, I deny that there are distinct ideas there, right? That's an illegitimate type of abstraction that we can't really carry out, that Locke thinks we can. So, um, so he doesn't deny that, you know, he, it's, it's not that he claims that since there can be no such visible necessary connection, there could be figure without extension or whatever. He just says that actually there aren't multiple ideas here. It's just one idea that we can't separate. Okay, but nevertheless, so, but he does deny that we ever have this visible necessary connection, which makes what Locke calls resemblance possible. Um, and moreover, this holds not only for our ideas, but for anything um, that is an idea in the sense that it's merely caused in a substance by, by the power of some substance. Right, so our ideas, as Locke agrees, you know, don't cause each other. They're all caused either by us or by external things. Um, and anything that's like that, um, Barclay is going to say, there can't be necessary relations between them. I mean, that is, there can't be immediate necessary relations between them that would be visible. If there's a necessary relationship between them, it will have to be by way of some active thing that causes them both. But there isn't this other kind of inert, visible necessity that Locke thinks there is, by which we can know for sure that this active thing must cause them both. There's just a bunch of ideas. I see I'm almost out of time. But um, so I'll read this from section 25 on page 33 to show that Barclay is thinking something like this. It is impossible for, oh, oops. Um, it is impossible for an idea to do anything, or, strictly speaking, to be the cause of anything. Neither can it be the resemblance or pattern of any active being. Right? So, that is, what an idea can't, what ideas can't resemble is something that's active, that has powers. I, so, and I think this is why. Ideas can't resemble things that have powers because ideas don't have powers. And this visible necessary connection by which Locke thought they never could, could, could represent those relationships between powers, Barclay thinks is absurd. Um... Um, so, therefore, you know, my ideas can't serve to represent um, any subject of powers, any substance. Um, that is, they can be caused by it, but they can't 
um, represent it by resembling it or being like it. So how can I represent a substance? And the answer is by being one. <laughs> That's the only way. I'm an active thing. I have powers. My acts of will can resemble someone else's acts of will. Um, but therefore, the only kind of substance I can represent is the kind I am, that is, a spirit. That's number one. And number two is, since um, I don't represent it as resembling my ideas, all its powers are bare powers. They're all secondary qualities, basically. Um, okay, and I would say more about that, but I'm two minutes over, so maybe I'll talk about this a little bit at the beginning next time, and I will see you then.